In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gotta wake up. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and always shall be. All right. Good morning, Kalimet. Good morning. Life uh, is a process of growth, right? Uh, hopefully, hopefully growth in a positive direction, right? What we might call maturation, maturing. A simple example of this is a child, right? At the beginning of you know, a baby's life, they're, they're a helpless blob, basically. And then within two, three years, they're, they're feeding themselves, they're walking, they're talking, and all of these things, right? There's this growth, this maturation that happens. Uh -huh. And hopefully, not just in the physical life, but also in the spiritual life, this also is valid, right? What I mean is that hopefully today, to give a very concrete image, so that hopefully today we can look back a year ago and see that we have grown spiritually in that span of time, that we've, we've become more mature spiritually. If, for example, patience is our struggle, hopefully today we can, we can look back and see that we have grown more patient in the last 12 months. If bitterness, right, lack of forgiveness, because that's what bitterness is, if lack of forgiveness is our struggle, hopefully today we can look back and we can see that over the last 12 months, we've become more open to forgiving and, and that bitterness has at least some degree dissipated, right? Today's gospel is not explicitly about this issue of spiritual growth, but, but I think it is at least tangentially related. And so today what I wanna do is I wanna offer us a picture of maturation as it is given to us in the gospel reading today. And I've, I've given my homily today a title. I have entitled it, Maturing from Sons to Fathers. Maturing from Sons, and you could add parenthetically daughters, to Fathers. That's the title. What do I mean by the title? Well, in today's gospel, we have three different sort of characters that are depicted for us in the reading. And each one represents something rather different rel relative to the kingdom of heaven, right? First we meet, quote, a certain man who had two sons. Needless to say, I don't need to describe who this is, this represents God the Father. Hopefully we all get that. Today I want to propose that He is our goal. He is our goal. The goal is to become like the Father. Our calling as Christians is to become more and more every day like God the Father. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Most of us likely don't equate ourselves with the Father. If we read the story, we don't think, oh yeah, I'm the Father in this story. Um, but we have, then we have two sons uh, with whom we might equate ourselves. Uh, the first is famously known as the prodigal son. He's the one after whom the story is named. Um, and he represents a life lived far away, at least for a period of time, far away from God, right, in the far country. A life of rejecting God's commandments of, uh, to use modern terminology, doing your own thing, right? That's what the prodigal son is. And my guess is that perhaps many of us, if we look back over our lives, can see a stretch of time when maybe we were the prodigal son or daughter. And, or, or we may have friends or spouses or children or neighbors or co-workers right now who are close to us, who maybe we perceive that they are sort of in the far country right now, right? To use terms from the reading today, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So that's the first there, right? The second, the second son that we meet just at the end of the story, the second son represents a different error in the spiritual life. The second son had stayed with the father, right? So ostensibly, he was a dutiful, good son. Um, and as the reading says, quote, Lo, this is the older son, or the second son speaking, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I never transgressed your commandment at, at any time, end quote. So where the first son fell into what, what we might call sort of flagrant or outright sinning, the second son fell into the error of what we might call self-righteousness, right? Of thinking that what he had done 
made him quote unquote good, right? In a sense, we could say that these are the three options that we have in life, right? So we are one of these three things. To be the prodigal, to be the self-righteous son, or to be the father. Now, obviously, those are extreme examples, but we're somewhere in the middle of all of that. But let's take a further look at the father, right, who is our main character in the story. Really, some people have said that the story shouldn't be called the prodigal son, but it should be called the forgiving father, because really, that's the point of the message. Now, as I mentioned at the start of my homily, life is a progression, right, a maturation. The image I began with was a little child who starts, you know, as a blob and then maybe crawls and then cruises and then walks and then runs and so on. And the same applies, I would suggest, uh, in the spiritual life. And today's parable emphasizes three attributes of God that we all need to struggle to have more of in our own lives in order to move from being the first or second son, either one, to become more like like the father, the goal. First, the father was patient. He was patient, right? We all know how hard it can be to be patient. And it's interesting, too, that in the story, the prodigal son was explicitly not patient, right? So we have sort of a, a dichotomy, you could say, right? Quote, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that falls to me, end quote. It's clear, pretty clear, that this was, would have been his inheritance, right? Which normally you get after your, your parents die, right? But this young man is eager to have his fun, right? He doesn't want to wait. He's impatient. He wants to have all the goodies now, right? The sooner the better. But the father is not like this, right? After the son leaves, we have sort of an interesting portrayal <coughs> of the father in really very few words. It says in the scriptures, quote, but when he was still a great way off, the prodigal son that is, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell at his neck and kissed him, end quote. For who knows how long it would seem, the father seemed to have had a routine of, I'm gonna guess every day, maybe going up to the roof of the house and looking down the road to see if perchance his prodigal son might be returning, right? This is patience. This is the patience of the father. So if you and I want to move from son status to father status, the first attribute we need to acquire is patience. Patience with ourselves, when things might not be as we want them to be. Patience with other people when they let us down or are mean to us or disappoint us. And lastly, Patience with the reality that God has given us, right? The life that God has placed us in. Right? That is what we need to be. So that's number one, attribute number one, patience. Secondly, the Father is forgiving. The Father is forgiving. He is, in fact, extremely, even we could say, inappropriately and inordinately forgiving, right? Almost offensively forgiving, we could say. And we can contrast this, interestingly, with the older son, right? Who is not forgiving. Indeed, he is very, very, very bitter. As the story reads, quote, this is the young, the, the second son. Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandments at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, he doesn't even call him my brother, right? This son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. Not a very forgiving portrayal of a person. Indeed, he doesn't, as I said, he doesn't even refer to him as his brother. He says, this son of yours, right? He disowns him, we might say. But the father, on the other hand, doesn't even let the younger son, right, the prodigal son, he doesn't even let him finish his prepared speech, right? He had a little prepared speech he was going to give to the father when he got back. But the father cuts him off and says, put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet and a robe on his back and kill the fatted calf and kill it, right? This, brothers and sisters, is the image of the forgiveness that God gives us and that we are called to give others, right? All is forgiven. And so again, we see what we need to move from son to father, which is forgiveness. It means that we need to look at those 
uh, little points of bitterness in our lives, or little places where maybe we have some bitterness, or maybe we have a lot of bitterness. Those people who have wronged us, and we need to resolve in our hearts to work on forgiving them. Notice how I didn't say forgive them, because it isn't the snap of the fingers, it's a process. But we need to start. I don't pretend it's easy, but being like God isn't easy, right? That's why there's so few saints. And it may not, and indeed likely will not happen overnight, right? But it won't happen at all if we don't resolve to begin to forgive those who have wronged us, right? If we don't begin to forgive, we're never going to forgive. So that's attribute number two, forgiveness. Lastly, St. Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, says the following. He says to the church, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice, right? Unlike the older son, again, who's our, the bad guy here, who is angry that the father would dare throw a party for the prodigal younger son, as the older son says, who, quote, has devoured your livelihood with harlots. The father rejoices at the return of the prodigal son. So we have the second son laments, but the dad, the father rejoices, right? He, the father says in response to the second son, it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. Notice he calls him your brother, by the way. And was lost and is found. Joy is the last attribute, number three, of the Father. And in truth, joy goes hand in hand with forgiveness, right? Because if we don't forgive, we can't really rejoice. Indeed, if we don't forgive, we really are, typically will do the opposite of rejoicing. To, to kind of spin off of St. Paul's passage, which I read a minute ago, if we're full of bitterness, rather than rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn, we will rejoice with those who mourn. God help us if we do that, right? And mourn with those who rejoice, right? So we'll turn everything upside down. We'll make everything the opposite of what God had intended it to be. But that is not the image of the Father that we are given in the Gospel reading today. And so today, uh, just really just two weeks and one day, just 15 days from the start of Great and Holy Lent, I want to challenge you to become more like the Father, to make it your own sort of Lenten resolution, might we say, to put on what the Father is, right? Patience, forgiveness, and joy. So that we no longer live as children, like the first and second brothers, right, who represent sort of a messed up spiritual reality, thrown about by every little wave that life brings us. But instead we grow up to the full measure of what the Christian life calls us to, which is to become like the Father. Amen. Please rise.